excited to introduce to you Bishop Sally Dick. Um, she is the ecumenical officer for the United Methodist Church, but um, a few other little known facts. She was born in Washington State, um, and she grew up as a Mennonite, which I, I just find fascinating. So ecumenical engagement um, has been a part of who she is all of her life. Um, she went to Boston University, and then Boston School of Theology, and then United, and she also has the Certificate of Completion from the World Council of Churches uh, Ecumenical Institute at Bosse. Um, currently, y'all, she's like really working hard. So currently, <laughs> she is the president of the General Board of Church and Society. She is our ecumenical officer, and she is also an active residential bishop, all of this in retirement. Um, so, and she's also, she's really a great leader and a great person with whom to work. So I'm excited that you get to hear a little bit from Bishop Sally Dick. Hi, um, this is kind of fun uh, looking across the screen. Um, Bishop Grove, so good to see you. You're a sweetheart to come on and maybe we just have a word from you at the end. Then there are these Northern Illinois people. That's pretty fun. You may not all live in Northern Illinois anymore, but um, good to see you. And then these Cal Nevada people who are here. Um, we're part of the National Workshop on Christian Unity and and the rest of you who, um, who I, I have met at, at different times. I think Jack and Renee um, and of course, Chris. Um, so, uh, just, it's nice. It's small. Uh, and I appreciate that. It's a busy time of the year. I, you know, I was going to give you this overview of the year. And, um, the one thing I will say is that over the course of 2022, um, the ecumenical office, uh, had 352 people engaged in, um, our work. Some of that was with You Might, the Plunge, uh, Young Adult, uh, all of that. We were able to be go in person again to some of those things. And, um, and so we really celebrate that. The World Council of Churches, as we talked before, was finally able to have to get its work done and to have its assembly. That was terrific. We started up some of our dialogues beginning in person because um, as David has begun, just got back um, from, um, that's where he lost his iPad, um, from uh, his the beginning the dialogue with the Catholics around migration and baptism. That's pretty exciting. And of course, um, we also have a kind of a new plan for our concordat with the um, uh, Methodist Church in Britain. So we've, we've really, really been able to kind of get some things going. And it's been exciting that way, that uh, in those ways. But you know, that's been kind of the challenge with my um, additional uh, responsibilities with the California Nevada Annual Conference. Is it's um, you know trying to do both things at the same time. So I appreciate um, my Cal Nevada colleagues here. But um, what I thought we would just talk about. We just have a few minutes, right? Like maybe 10, 15. What I thought I would talk about is you may have seen um, the uh, religious news service article about this advent, churches are urged to assess worship for inadvertent anti-Semitism. Do you see that? And um, the Council of Centers on Jewish Christian Relations put out a document called A National Reckoning of the Soul, a call to the churches of the United States to confront the crises of anti-Semitism. And the article um, raised, uh, you know, during this Advent season, do we inadvertently um, speak in ways uh, they didn't use this, but I would say, you know, um, uh, making Jesus the exceptional Jew. Uh, do we make sure that we ground what we say in the fact that he was Jewish, his family was Jewish, and they were um, uh, 
uh, within the tradition of Judaism, as you read the story, um, you know, you, um, you get that Mary and Joseph took Jesus <clears throat> to, to be circumcised and dedicated. And so, you know, certainly well grounded within Judaism. And then um, they raised, you know, even in our hymns, do we inadvertently convey anti-Semitic thoughts? And they raised, O come, O come, Emmanuel. Oh, that was a stab to the heart. And not that it's um, overtly anti-Semitic, but I was, I was reading the words again and they, and they suggested in this article that <clears throat> it can seem like, you know, Jesus came and the Jews just didn't come along. Therefore, Jesus against the Jews, Christianity against the Jews. And it's kind of this um, oppositional attitude that, of course, got um, uh, embedded Luther, you know, he was pretty anti-Semitic. Um, one of my Orthodox rabbi friends is reading Luther and it kind of puts him over the edge because he was very anti-Semitic and it, it, it really embedded in, um, you know, much of uh, reformed Christianity, uh, that anti-Semitic oppositional, and of course, then the Jews killed Jesus kind of thing. Um, I, I actually don't see it, I don't think, as much in Advent and Christmas as we go into the new year and, you know, particularly Luke, you know, I've said many times, I'm sure, you know, Jesus, could you just stay home on the Sabbath? Um, because he repeatedly heals. And that's when we begin to encounter potentially anti-Semitic messages. Um, you know, the story of the woman, the bent over woman, um, it's the leader of the synagogue who gets on his case. The people around Jesus are rejoicing that this woman is freed of her um, dis disability. Um, religious leaders take a pretty big hit, <laughs> um, but are religious leaders different than the corpus of Judaism? How do we convey that Jesus again is the exceptional Jew? And you know, his statements around the Sabbath and the Sabbath um, being a time that Judaism has always celebrated, you know, the joy of creation, um, the joy of the day, my Orthodox friends, uh, how they celebrate the Sabbath is really quite inspiring. And, but it does make these limitations that, um, that they live within. Uh, as you know, like he said to me the other day, like he knows I'm coming uh, and I could go to Shabbat. I'll go to Shabbat at their house. Um, but he's like, you know, Sally, uh, you know how important the Sabbath is to me that I wouldn't go and pick you up at the airport. And I was like, you don't need to pick me up at the airport. But that, that kind of was the way in which he said, this, this is so important to me. Um, but within that is this joy of the Shabbat. Within this is the joy of the relationships. And in the law itself, it doesn't prohibit people um, from doing something to prevent the, um, uh, the death or um, you know, the danger of another person, but we often make it sound that way. And then of course, as we get towards Good Friday, you know, Jews still are hesitant to go out sometimes on Good Friday. Um, and, and, you know, hearing, okay, so we go back to this season, hearing reports of people who said, you know, I don't really want to light my Hanukkah, Hanukkah uh, candles in the window uh, to identify that I'm Jewish because the anti-Semitism has 
increased multifold in communities. Um, having a, I lead a scripture study with Jewish and some Christian, some Jewish and Christian women. And it was just so, and we did, and we do women in the Bible. And um, we do New Testament as well as Hebrew. And we did marry the mother of, and it became apparent again, just painfully apparent uh, how um, uh, Jews in our uh, US culture live in fear and sensitivity to anti-Semitism. So I kind of just want to put that out for you and ask how, if at all, you, you are conscious of, of making sure that you don't contribute to anti-Semitism. What do you have to be careful about? And how do you even teach, um, you know, what's the voice of the church uh, to say that anti-Semitism is wrong? So I throw it out. I think we have a few more minutes, right, Jean? Okay. Comments? Welcome, Katiana. Another Northern Illinois. -er. Have you thought about this? Um, Kiko? I guess, well, there's the whole thing about <clears throat> supersessionism, right? And how like the covenant that Jesus makes is the new covenant. And so somehow all the previous covenants of which there were many are no longer valid. And that's um, problematic and I feel a little, hesitant to admit this in front of a bishop um, or a couple of bishops, excuse me. Um, but in the communion liturgy, it says a new covenant and I always change it to another covenant. And I don't know if that's right, but um, I'm just really mindful of the that supersessionist like thread that runs through some of our liturgy. Do people in your church note that? No. <laughs> <laughs> they oh, they haven't filed a complaint against you. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, I, I always change father to creator and, you know, we, we do those things. Thank you. Oh, yes. That's interesting. And supersessionism. Um, I meant to mention that. And so thank you Akiko, for, for, um, for mentioning that and actually how it is that you practice um, mindfulness about it. Mm -hmm. And I think the mindfulness also it needs to be there as we're working with these scriptures that people have heard time and time again through the years. And when we have an opportunity to put, uh, to open it up, to put another slant, to reveal how this has been used. But, you know, when we read it, there's so many things that it's just, it's how we relay it and how we say it. And I think we can continue with that. And for ideas, um, many of us have worked with Amy Jo Levine and right. her books and other things. She has wonderful ways to have you, yes, yes, to look at this and think in another way. I misunderstood so, you. Yes, yes. So we have a lot of good tools, I think, at our disposal if we use them and then share them when we're preaching. I think she may have done an advent. Um, she does. The light of the yes. world. Thank yes. you. Chris. Yes, we've used that and it's wonderful. And um, I have, yeah. one. I oh, have her, her uh, Lenten Passion Week one and maybe would commend that to you if you don't already have and I it. would echo that. We use that in Galena as a community, as an ecumenical piece wow, as we cool. shared that during Lent. Very powerful, good comments. Good. I tried to get Amy Jill to Northern Illinois as the Bible study leader for annual conference and we just can never work out mm -hmm. the date. She's busy teaching Christians. So I cut somebody right. off. Right. Well, and we did have her at the national workshop as our Bible study. That was really wonderful. Mm -hmm. And then certainly um, Reconciling Convocation has had her as their primary speaker at times at, at Vanderbilt. 
the silence. <laughs> Our congregation is using Amy Jo Levine's um, Advent study um, as a congregational read this right year. Um, yeah, so we're in the midst of that, which has led to some really good and interesting conversations. The other thing um, for me is it's hard to know what you don't know. And um, so um, I've been building a wonderful relationship with one of the rabbis in town and we have been sharing liturgy with one another and just talking through like what like how he sees our liturgy versus um how i see it right um and then also studying some of the liturgy that they use for their services and i will say um it is uh when i when i am a part of their um worship services the language that they have for god is so expansive it puts to shame um anything that i have seen um in in my christian experience and so that has just been a very rich um opportunity for us to be able to have those conversations because i think even if we are saying that we're committed to looking at um and trying to eliminate anti-Semitism from our liturgy and our worship services, it's hard to know when you don't know. Excellent, excellent. Anybody else? This isn't related to um, obviously the Advent or Christmas season, but there's a definite desire sometimes or, or interest intrigue and in, you know christian satyrs and that sort of thing could you speak oh. to that kiko can speak to that <laughs> oh my goodness um so our coir committee at last uh annual conference put together can't remember the resolutions title but something about supporting our jewish neighbors in light of the increasing uh, hate crimes against the Jewish communities. And so we had like this very friendly list of suggestions. Um, and I talked to our local rabbi here in Fresno and he said, please ask your colleagues and the Christian congregations in your conference not to do satyrs unless they were, um, uh, <laughs> sorry, unless they were done like cooperatively with a rabbi or or something like this and during the legislative section that was the thing that people really got hung up on they're like you're trying to take away our monday thursday and i'm like no they are two very very different <laughs> very different holidays <laughs> um and yeah i i i don't know is i guess that was kind of the crux of it but it, i was really amazed how much like pushback we got about that yeah and it got clarified by the time we we came to annual conference but it it was this sensitivity that we can't have monday thursday because that'd be anti-semitic no that's not the point thanks for raising that renee just a note on that is interesting my, my wife does one with her confirmation clause but with a jewish uh, professor of Jewish studies who actually leads that and she she and, and uh, so it becomes a way of teaching the confirmation class kids um, Passover from a Jewish perspective and not from a Christian perspective. Mm -hmm. That's good. Great. I'm, I'm glad there's there's some um so much awareness, at least in this uh, Zoom, it's actually heartening to me. Um, but I think the church, including the United Methodist Church, could really benefit from a little more education about that and sensitivity to it. Um, and so I'm really glad that, that so many of you are doing that. I also want to say that one of the challenges of my job as ecumenical officer is to impress upon um, even my colleague bishops um, the importance of our ecumenical witness. Um, and uh, 
uh, you know, we'll see that as the budget comes forward for the next quadrennium, 24 to 28. And um, while we are spending down um, reserves, uh, it's, it's um, it, you know, it looks like, you know, it's going to be difficult going forward. So, you know, I had an idea if you feel comfortable doing it, and a couple of you don't have to because I'm your bishop. <laughs> But um, if you would just let your bishop know how much you benefit from uh, you might in and of itself or anything else that you do through the ecumenical um, office um, and just say, hey, you know, I'm so glad United Methodists do this. Thank you very much as, uh, as a bishop for supporting this. I would love it if you would do that just a nice, and you know, bishops love positive emails, let me tell you. And, and <laughs> Does anyone give, have, oh, sorry. No, I was going to ask if anyone had a, a, a letter that they might have shared that they do share as, a, as an inspirational guide, but it's okay if we, if we do our each. Yeah, just a quick little email. Thanks for the work of the Council of Bishops with you, Mike. It's really helpful. And then can I just give Bishop Grove two, two minutes to say hello? And he has a long history and, and legacy of support for ecumenism. <clears throat> well, friends, I just decided uh, I knew about this meeting and I thought that I would check in. Uh, Bishop Dick is one of my uh, dear friends her college, um, not graduate school friend, is my daughter, and she is in our apartment right now. She does not ah. on a, a Zoom call with uh, Sally Dick, but uh, Hi, Sally. Uh, Hi, Susan. Susan. <laughs> oh wow, that's something. Uh, that doesn't mean <laughs> anything to any of you except Sally and Sue and I. But they were Sue was in uh, graduate school when Sally was in seminary, and they were friends. Anyway. I was the first ecumenical officer. The office was created in 1996. It's a four year term for retired bishops. There have been five between Bishop Dick and me, which tells you approximately how old I am. Which <laughs> most of the people on this call were still in the MYF when I was ecumenical officer. But uh, I believe deeply well, let me say, I was about to say, I believe deeply in the call to Christian unity. You know, um, the scriptural banner, banner call for humanism is in John 20, when Jesus prayed, may they all be one that the world may believe. I often think that Jesus prayed that on the night before he was, knew he was going to die. And the thing I think we will all pray about on the night before we die, maybe very close to our hearts, mm -hmm. tells me that the unity of the friends and followers of and disciples of Jesus was at the center of his heart. And I just felt I had the time and I thought there might be some new young ecumenists here. And I would just uh, sign in and say, hello, and God bless you. And yes, do send an email to your bishop and encourage her or him to keep us in the budget. Thank you, Bishop Dick. <laughs> thank you. Jean, it's all yours. That was a blessing. Oh, thank you so much, Bishop Grove, for coming on. Yeah, thank you both very much. And I'm just going to pass it to Chris, who's going to close it out for us. But thank you, Bishop Dick, very much and Bishop Grove for your words. We are grateful that you um, have both joined us and for the conversation um, that all of you have engaged in with us today. I would invite us to be in a time of prayer. Oh, wonderful counselor. Oh, mighty God. We gather together in this season to give thanks for the many, many ways that you have become Emmanuel, the holy in our presence over many centuries. Even as we prepare to gather with 
friends and family, to gather as a community of faith, to celebrate and to remember the birth of the one we call the Prince of Peace. We remember his last prayer on earth. The one in which he prayed that we would all be one in you. And so we pray for that kind of unity too. As celebrations continue, as meals are shared, as gifts are given and received, may there always be room in our hearts for you to find a birthing place, a place where justice takes root, a place where love grows and flourishes, a place where unity becomes not only our hope, but our very way of life. Give us the faith of the shepherds. Give us the heart of Mary. Give us the understanding of Joseph. Give us the hospitality of the innkeeper who made room even when there seemed to be no room. All so that you may offer blessing in and through our connection to a weary world. Draw us together, O oh, wonderful counselor, O oh, mighty God, that our witness may be one of unity and love in you, we pray. Amen. Thank you all for joining us. I look forward to seeing you all in January on the 17th. Wonderful. Good to see you all, dear Take friend. Take care. Good Happy to see you. Holidays,